Okay. <clears throat> As the film clip reveals, war veterans holding government bonus certificates which were due in 1945, years into the future, demanded Congress pay them off now when the money was desperately needed. And as historian Jennifer Keene emphasizes, this was called, it was called selective service. And what they wanted, and she insisted, and she understands what the soldiers insisted, was adjusted compensation. It was not a bonus. They wanted to be paid for their service. And so they began to migrate to Washington from all over the country with their families or alone. And they came in broken down old autos, they stole rides on freight trains, or they hitchhiked. Now, historian Howard Zinn writes that they were immigrant miners from West Virginia, sheet metal workers from Columbus, Georgia, and unemployed immigrant Polish veterans from Chicago. And more than 20,000 came. And John Dos Passos described their encampment across the Potomac River from the capital in a place called Anacostia Flats. He wrote that the men are sleeping in little lean-tos built out of old newspapers, cardboard boxes, packing crates, bits of tin or tar paper roofing, every kind of cockeyed makeshift shelter from the rain scraped together out of the city dump. And the bill to pay off on the bonus passed the House, but is going to be defeated in the Republican Senate. And then President Herbert Hoover ordered the army to evict them. So clearly, capitalism is capitalism. Let's go back to the documentary and see what happened to the bonus army. While streams of bonus marchers headed toward the capital, Pelham Glassford, the new DC police chief, prepared for their invasion. I had been aware from the first that the BEF was symbolic of the vast army of unemployed. Anything unfortunate that happened might easily precipitate widespread social disorder. Helen Glassford was a decorated brigadier general during World War I who commanded the loyalty of his men in a very personal way. Glassford was really pleased in many ways that the veterans were coming to Washington. But he knew that the politicians were not sympathetic. Officials were also concerned that a large number of African-American veterans were mixed in with the marchers. And the irony is that going back to the Great War, the African-American troops were segregated from the white troops. Also preparing for the bonus army was a prominent World War I veteran, General Douglas A. MacArthur. The United States Army, through its military intelligence division, remain greatly concerned about the possibility of revolution. The Army developed a plan to defend the United States Capitol in the case of civil insurrection. And they were talking about using tanks, machine guns, gas. By the time the bonus marchers arrived in Washington, the Army was more than ready to deal with them. At the end of May 1932, nearly 10,000 bonus marchers occupied the nation's capital, and tens of thousands more were on their way. Police Chief Glassford realized he was on his own. They followed their leaders in the childlike faith that their government would help them, just as they had responded during the war. Hence, I felt these veterans could not be treated like bums. On June 4th, thousands of Washingtonians lined the streets to see what the Washington Post called the strangest military parade the Capitol had ever witnessed. The BEF was marching in full force. Within days, Walter Waters had a full-fledged lobbying operation underway. The veterans, frankly, made a nuisance of themselves. A couple of veterans were always sitting in each representative's waiting rooms. <laughs> the representatives were solicited outside the building as well. The strategy quickly paid off. After just two weeks, the House of Representatives passed the bonus bill. The BEF had won a battle. 
but a greater one awaited them in the Senate. In a remote neighborhood of Washington known as Anacostia, an enormous tent and shack city rose from the mudflats. Here, the threadbare heroes of World War I formed their last great encampment. We just drove in and we were ankle deep in mud. I never saw so much mud in my life. American flags could be seen flying from every possible vantage point. A city was laid out in Anacostia. The streets were named by states. There was a library in the center of it run by the Salvation Army. But there was music day and night. There was gospel music, and there was blues music, and there was country music, and popular music. There are people who built beautiful little replicas of, of suburban homes. There were guys who were buried alive for money. I well remember the veteran uh, laying in a casket, saying, hey, they treat us like we were dead people. A popular form of entertainment in the camp was boxing. I, I was the best boxer. I was. We boxed. We passed the hat. My dad would get a little irate if we didn't really punch each other out. Then he'd throw up both of our arms. It was always a draw, always a draw, always a draw. People across the country sympathized with the bonus marchers' plight. But to official Washington, they were just a sign of trouble on the horizon. One of the stories that went largely unreported was that the color line seemed to have vanished in the bonus army camps. Visitors were astonished to see black veterans and white veterans sharing billets, chores, and rations. The military experience has the potential for transcending things like race and for black veterans to be in company with white veterans was a revolutionary thing. Roy Wilkins, an enterprising young reporter working for the NAACP, decided to visit and see for himself. At Anacostia, there was no residential segregation. Recruits of any color were made welcome. It was a big event in the part of the city that I lived in. They had groups of whites and Negroes that formed a unit because they were from the same state. That was not so usual for the city of Washington. And there were lots of people, especially people in the military, who saw this as a very, very dangerous thing. And right there was the tragedy of it all. Men can live, eat, play, and work together, be they black or white, just as the BEF demonstrated. On June 17, 1932, thousands of bonus marchers assembled on Capitol Hill to maintain a vigil on the Senate, scheduled to vote on the bonus bill passed by the House. The shouts and songs of the veterans, the Yanks are starving, the Yanks are starving, could be heard in the Senate chamber as the heated debate went on. Late in the day, Waters delivered the result to his troops. The Senate overwhelmingly defeated the bonus bill, and the men were extraordinarily disappointed. But fortunately, a newspaper reporter suggested to Waters that he ought to order the men to sing America. And they did. They all sang America. And they dispersed peacefully. But Waters urged the marchers to remain in Washington. 